Good morning. Welcome to our First Light Worship Service on this beautiful fall Sunday morning. Things are going to be a little different today in worship. Uh, I am going to be your narrator, guiding us through our worship service like you would see at a, a B-minus high school production of a play. Uh, I'm going to be leading us through worship because this month we're talking about why we do what we do. Uh, and the first thing we're going to be talking about is why we worship the way that we do. So rather than have one big sermon halfway through the service, you're going to get four really little sermons. And the whole church says, Amen. Amen. There we go. So we start today a little differently. We're not starting with a big song. We're, we're going to kind of unpack why we do the different parts of our worship. And the first thing I want to talk about is why and what is worship. What is worship? Worship sometimes is your five-year-old son coming home and in Sunday afternoon standing and walking around the house and he says, Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven up over and over and over and over. And you finally say, okay, I'm glad you got it. Can we sing a different song? Uh, sometimes worship is a little different. Sometimes it's waking up on a Sunday morning thinking you're going to go to church and you look over at your husband, and he's doubled over, and he can't move. And so you call some friends, and you say, hey, we're not going to make it to church today. i, I got to take him to the hospital. And you go to the hospital, and you wait all day, and you don't hear anything. And so you get nervous, and you start to get anxious. And by the time uh, evening rolls around, about 10 o'clock at night, the surgeon comes in and says, well, uh, your, your husband needs to have surgery. And we can either do the surgery now or in the morning, but he'll probably be dead by the morning. And so at 10 o'clock at night, you sign the papers, and your husband is whisked away to the operating room. And you find yourself walking through a, a very empty hospital in the middle of the night, and you go to the surgical waiting room where there's nobody at 10 o'clock at night because no one schedules surgeries at 10 o'clock at night. And when you open the door to go into the surgical waiting room, you find 20 people from your church who have been waiting just for you to sit and pray with you all night until your husband comes out of surgery. Sometimes worship is showing up on a Sunday morning and a handsome man dressed in all black wearing a long white scarf tells you what's going on in church. You re really never know what you're going to get. Now, I haven't been here that long, but I have been here long enough to hear a lot of you ask a lot of questions about why we do certain things. Why do we have candles down here on the altar? Why do we have a cross? Why do you wear something like this? Why do we say certain prayers? Why do we sing certain songs? Why do we have communion on the first Sunday of the month? All these questions. Now, I think we have these questions because some of us have been coming to church so long, we just do these things without really thinking about why we do them. Or we've started recently attending church, and because it's what happens, we don't give it a second thought, and we just kind of go with the flow. And yet everything we do, we do because there's a purpose. Because there's a purpose. For the last 2,000 years, disciples of Jesus Christ have been gathering to worship God from the secretive upper rooms of the first century during the time of the Acts of the Apostles to the ornate and opulent cathedrals of Europe to contemporary gymnasiums with folding chairs to the comfort of our couches over the last year and a half watching worship over the internet. Worship is what we do as Christians. Because worship follows a liturgy. Liturgy comes from the Latin word liturgia, which means work of the people. Now, you might not know it, you might not realize it, particularly during this service, but our worship has four parts of our liturgy. We are, there are four parts of our work. We gather, we proclaim, we respond, and we are sent forth. Now, the reason we have these four parts is because that's how the ancient Israelites used to worship, but we also do it because that's what happens in the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They are gathered by the Lord. The Lord proclaims Scripture to them. They go to a town, and they break bread together, and then they are sent forth. So we do what we do every Sunday because that's what Jesus did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. So hear this Scripture. It's Luke 24. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking about all that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what were you two discussing while you were walking? And they stood still, looking sad, and then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, 
Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know what has taken place these days? And he said, well, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a, a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how the chief priests and the leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hope that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since all these things took place. Moreover, some women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and they did not find his body there. They came back and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. So here we have Jesus encountering these two disciples on the road. And he says, well, what are y'all talking about? And they say, well, who are you? Where have you been? Have you been living under a rock? Do you not know what has taken place in Jerusalem these days? Jesus meets them on the road. He gathers them together because something extraordinary is about to take place. I love this because these two disciples, they don't bring anything to the table. They're not the most faithful. We, don't, we only learn one of their names. I mean, they weren't the ones who were sitting in Sunday school class every Sunday morning. They weren't the ushers handing around the offering plates in worship. They were two guys walking along the road, and that's when Jesus shows up to them. Years ago, I was leading a worship service, and I was wearing my robe. It was a traditional worship service, and the way that we did worship there, when the first hymn began, I would process down the center aisle, and I would sing as the acolyte would come and light the candle, and we'd get on with worship. And I got halfway down the center aisle when behind me, I heard a woman yelling. So I turned around. I walked back down the center aisle while the hymn continued to play. And I found the sweetest, oldest, grandmotherly type woman in our church yelling at her grandson in our narthex. Now, as a practically minded preacher, I went in and said, would you all please be quiet? We're trying to worship God. And she looked at me and she said, preacher, I choose this tall, preacher, I need you to teach my grandson a lesson. I said, well, I'm in the preaching and teaching business. What lesson shall I bestow upon your grandson? And she said, look at what he wore to church. And I looked at him. He was wearing a button-up shirt, but he was wearing blue jeans. And so she said, preacher, will you tell him he is disrespecting the Lord if he dares to enter the house of the Lord wearing blue jeans? And I pulled back my robe, and I was wearing blue jeans. The things we get worked up over, the things we really care about in worship, I'm here to tell you the Lord does not care about them as much. Come as you are. As long as you don't come in your birthday suit, you're fine, okay? God meets these disciples in Jesus Christ on the road, gathers them together with with all of their hopes and all their dreams, but also all of their sorrow and all of their grief, and he is about to make something of their nothing. God gathers us. There's always this question about, well, when does worship start? Does it start when some preacher type starts talking? Is it when the music plays? Well, worship actually starts long before any of you get here. God is in the business of gathering your thoughts and your minds and your prayers from the moment you wake up to while you're driving in your car to when you're entering the building. It's all a part of our worship. It doesn't only happen in this room. It happens all Sunday long because God is, delights in gathering us together so here during this service one of the things we like to do to help gather ourselves is is we have announcements about what we're about to do we we sing two songs we get in this habit of retuning our frequencies to hear what god has to say and sometimes it takes two songs you know you might be singing through that first song you're like okay i'm happy i'm here in worship but god i gotta go to kroger this afternoon I got to get food, and I have not mowed my lawn. It takes time to let all those thoughts kind of pass. Sometimes it takes two songs for the Lord to fully gather us together, just like God gathered those disciples on the road so that we can be prepared for the next part of our worship. Worship is work. It really is. It's a habit. It's something we do over and over again. We're training our spiritual muscles to be in a position where we can really hear what God is trying to say to us. This is how God gathers us every week, just like God gathered those disciples on the road. So now I turn off my narration, and we get to the business of worship. Christy, let's welcome everybody. 
Welcome. <laughs> I'm Christy Burton, the worship leader here at the First Light Service, and um, we're delighted that you've chosen to be here this morning. Um, I'm excited about the service because it's really, I don't like anything different. I, I've always, I just like to mix things up. So we pray that our service glorifies our Lord and Savior and invites the Holy Spirit to dwell among us. And I know there's a quote that I read when I was reading this book about worship. And it said that worship helps change your focus from the temporary to the eternal. I don't know, that has just kind of stuck stuck with me. So it is going to be different today. So we are, we are uh, delighted to have you all here in person with us for worship. For those of you who are worshiping with us uh, online from home, thank you for being with us. Please let us know that you're worshiping by commenting or sharing the video. You can email the church. Psalm 33.3 says, Sing to him a new song, play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us offer ourselves to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And that's from Hebrews. So feel free to worship as you feel led in the spirit this morning. And just as a reminder, we uh, our current Healthy Church guidelines are such that if you've been vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. But you're, of course, welcome to do so if you would like to. If you have not been vaccinated, and a holy place for those who come to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness endures forever. And as Revelation 19.1 reminds us, we will hear a great voice of much people in the heaven saying, Hallelujah. What does that mean? Do you all know what hallelujah actually means? Praise the Lord. Jagalaro wins. Yay. Salvation and glory and honor and power be to the Lord God. Let's stand and join in singing, Raise a Hallelujah.
Stewardship Sunday, Sunday, this Sunday, we're going to be talking about worship, and we have Chris Keller here with us, and he's going to tell us a little bit about why worship is important to him and how Raleigh Court helps with his worship. Chris? Thanks, David. So worship is really important to me because life is so busy, and it can be so difficult to just slow down and to find time to just pause and to really just honor the Lord and to just magnify and glorify Him. And worship gives me that perfect excuse. I'm here, I can pause, and I can just set my heart on honoring Him and bringing glory to Him. And that's really why I love worship. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for watching. Back to narration. The second part of our service is all about proclamation. It's the time in which God proclaims God's word to us. So usually this takes place with the reading of scripture and the offering of a sermon. Uh, this happens in our contemporary worship. It happens in our traditional worship. This is something that Christians have been doing since the very beginning. In Acts, we read about how they committed themselves to scripture and the exhortation of it, the, the proclaiming of it, not just reading it, but talking about what it might mean, how it might resonate daily with our lives. And we do this because the second part of the Emmaus story is that after Jesus listened to the disciples ramble on and on about what they had seen and heard, Scripture tells us that Jesus proclaimed the stories of the Old Testament and he interpreted them through himself. He took the Scriptures and he talked about them and interpreted them through himself. Now for us on any given Sunday morning, our scripture that we read comes from this thing called the Revised Common Lectionary. It's, it's a three-year cycle of readings for every Sunday. Now I know I'm already losing some of you, so bear with me for a moment. The Revised Common Lectionary is something that an ecumenical, that means a, a very broad group of churches put together years and years and years ago, and it is a, a set of texts for every Sunday morning so that churches all across the globe hear the same scriptures on Sunday together. So you might not know this, but the, the scripture that we read on Sunday, there's a very good chance it's the same scripture they're reading over at Raleigh Court Press, or that they're reading it Christ Lutheran, now, Virginia Heights Baptists, they do whatever they want. You know, they don't follow the Revised Common Lectionary most of the time. But it's this really beautiful thing to know that what you hear in a Methodist church, if you go to lunch after worship and there's other people there who went to a different church, they could have heard the same scriptures that you did. So we designed this, well, we, the church designed these texts so that we were going through almost the whole of the Bible every three years. So we usually use those scriptures to guide our worship service, for me to preach on on Sunday mornings. So that's where the scriptures come from. Now a sermon, let me tell you, sermons are weird things. I've been doing this uh, just about every Sunday for eight, nine years now, and I still don't feel like I know what I'm doing when I preach a sermon. Because every sermon is different. You can't preach the same sermon twice, even if you use the same words you've used before, because the people who hear it, the moments of worship, it all changes. But at its heart, a sermon is supposed to shed light on God's scripture. One of my professors in seminary said, the best sermons are forgettable ones. So that the person who hears the sermon, they don't remember what you said about it, but the next time they read their Bible, they'll remember, oh, this is why this is important. Now that's a challenge because every, every preacher wants to be remembered. You know, you want to make people laugh. You want to say something so good that everyone shouts amen. But sometimes it's important to get out of the way of what God is saying through Scripture. Years and years ago, when I was uh, a young kid, I ran the soundboard for my home church. I would sit back there every Sunday, and I'd turn the knobs and raise the levels. And we had a choir director. His name was Ed Burgess, and Ed Burgess scared the bejesus out of me, okay? He was the toughest, roughest, most self-serious man I've ever met in my life. And I was 12 years old, back there doing the knobs, and he would come up to me, and he'd say, You better get it right this week, Mertens. And then he'd go with the choir and sing their anthem. And I, I would shake back there. I was so afraid. And this man, every week, he'd have some sort of comment. And I, I would try to hide from him, honestly, because he just really frightened me so much. So fast forward a couple years, and I'm a teenager. And the pastor, during the sermon, says, Taylor, come up here. And he puts some drums in front of me. And he says, when I tell you to play the drums, you play the drums. Now, again, this is in the middle of a sermon, and there's no warning about this. And so he starts to tell the story of David dancing before the ark. 
that, that the Israelites had gotten the ark back, and David is so moved, he, he removes his clothing, he only has a loincloth on, and he starts to dance. And so the preacher says, Ed Burgess, the terrifying choir director, come forward. When a preacher tells you to do something in worship, you kind of have to do it. So Ed came forward, and he stood by the altar, and he said, Taylor, start playing the drums. And then he looked at Ed, and he said, Ed, start dancing. <laughs> Friends, Ed didn't move. He said, Taylor, don't stop. He said, Ed, I'm your preacher. Start dancing. Ed took off his suit jacket. He started to roll up his sleeves. And for the fleetingest of moments, I thought he was going to punch the preacher in the face. But what he actually did was he took his suit jacket, he tied it underneath his legs and around his waist, and while I played the drums, he danced like a fool all over the chancel area. And the entire congregation erupted in laughter. That Sunday after worship, Ed came up to me and he said, thank you for playing the drums. And I just couldn't believe that that human being was the same human being I had known my whole life. And he said, you know, if you can't have fun in church, you're doing it wrong. Ed died just a month ago, and his funeral was yesterday. And I wrote that story, and I sent it to the preacher at that church, and I said, I don't care what you do in that funeral, but you've got to tell that story about Ed Burgess dancing in front of the ark. Now, I tell that to you now because for the rest of my life, I will never be able to read that scripture about David dancing without thinking about Ed ever again. Do I remember anything else from that sermon? No. Do I remember what I said last week in my sermon? Not really. That's okay. I kind of think of sermons as spiritual food that get us from one Sunday to the next. Every one of us has had countless meals throughout our life, and some of them probably stand out. You know, a, a, an awesome restaurant or certain company you had, but food is sustenance to get you to the next meal. Sermons are spiritual theological sustenance to get us from one Sunday to the next. Preachers dare to talk about God. And God, bewilderingly enough, chooses preachers to speak to us today. So this is how God proclaims God's word every week. Just like God in Christ pro proclaimed God's word to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. So let's hear what God has to say. Now back turning off narration. Our scripture today comes from Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. Hear now God's holy word. Then he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. And all God's people say, Amen. And now you will hear the shortest sermon you will ever hear in your life. God loves you, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Back to narration. <laughs> the third part of our service is about responding. So God gathers us, God proclaims God's word, and then we respond to what God has said. Now, in any given church, this takes on different shapes, different forms, it looks differently. Most churches, the way that we respond is by giving of ourselves. We give our tithes, we give our offerings, uh, sometimes we give our prayers. Uh, on the first Sunday of every month, we have communion. It's the way that we respond because that's what Jesus did with the disciples on the road. So hear this part of the story. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. And so he went in and stayed with them. And when he was at the table with him, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, gave it to them and their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Were our hearts not burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? This is our chance to respond, to respond to what God has said and how God has gathered us. Like I said, we sometimes respond by giving of ourselves. We offer prayers. We offer our financial gifts. We offer our presence. We break bread with each other in hopes and anticipation that God will open our eyes, just as Jesus opened the eyes of his disciples so that we might see who is really and truly in our midst. 
Now, communion is worth its own sermon series, but suffice it to say that when we eat here, this is what being a Christian is all about. This table, it unites us with all who have come before us, and it unites us with all who will be here long after we're gone. This table physically extends to our own dining room tables, but it also extends through time. It is a weird and bewildering moment in which we get a little taste of heaven on earth. Whenever Jesus is asked about the kingdom of heaven, he compares it most often to a wedding feast when people gather together to eat because that's a joyful occasion. That's what we're promised that the kingdom of heaven will be like for us, a giant family reunion like at a wedding of God with God's church. And that's where we celebrate. Many years ago, I always have stories. Many years ago, I went to morning prayer with a bunch of Episcopalians. We would use the Book of Common Prayer, and I was the token Methodist. So all these Episcopalians and me. And we would go through the liturgy, we'd say the prayers, we'd read the scripture, and every once in a while, we would have communion. So one Sunday, they had prepared ahead of time, kind of like we do, the juice is already in the cup. They had already prepared it, and it was full to the brim because they were expecting there to be like 50 students. But the weather was so bad that day that there were only three of us. Now, one of the things that's different about the way Episcopalians do communion versus the way we do communion is that not only do they not dip it, they actually drink from a common cup, they don't use grape juice. They use port wine. I did not remember that this particular Monday morning at 7 o'clock. And so when I went forward to get my wafer, the priest gave it to me. And because he knew he was going to have to drink the whole rest of the cup by himself, when he offered it to my lips, he started pouring that sucker down my throat. My cheeks filled up like a monkey with port, warm port wine at 7 o'clock in the morning. I went back to my seat like this, thinking, am I going to spit this wine out on the floor? And I had to drink it. I had to consume it. And let me tell you, my 8 a.m. class was the best class I ever went to in seminary. But the worst part of it was, everybody who came near me, they said, what, have you been out all night? I said, no, I was drinking the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's good to be able to laugh about something like communion. We do it in different ways. Different churches have different forms. It used to be that people came and knelt here at this altar rail. Uh, bread was given to them and a little shot glass, a little thimble of grape juice was provided for you to drink it. It used to be before the pandemic, by intinction, you would come forward, you get a piece of bread, you dip in the cup, or see it. it doesn't matter how you do it, but what is being communicated to us? Well, God's grace. It's God's grace. Just like a sermon might be spiritual food, communion is theological spiritual food that really sustains us deep in our bones. It's, it's a way that we are consumed by that which we consume. So every week, we respond to God gathering us and to what God proclaimed. And so now we're going to respond by praying a time of offering. We're going to respond by having communion, and we're also going to respond by having two new people join our church. This is the way in which God gathers, God speaks, and we respond. So let us pray. O Lord, if we give you thanks for all that you have given to us, for we know that every blessing first comes from you. We pray, Lord, that you might reveal yourself to us continually through scripture and through gathering, through communion, through the ways that we give of ourselves. We know, O oh Lord, that we are like those disciples, that we really bring nothing to you, but you make something of our nothing. So we pray that you continue to do that for us, through us, this day and every day. And we do this while praying the prayer that your son taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our band is going to play for us during our time of offering. I encourage you to give of yourself with glad and generous hearts. You can give uh, online if you don't have actual physical money with you or a check. You can give 
uh, through our church website. Uh, you can give if you do have it through our offering plates we have here at the back or at the front of our sanctuary. You can also give of yourselves during this time. Pray. Think about how God might be calling you to encounter someone on the road of their life, to be present with them just as Jesus was present for those two disciples. Uh, but as the video showed earlier uh, with David and Chris, this is also our stewardship month. Each of these Sundays, we're going to be thinking about how we can only do these things that we do because of your generous gifts, your extravagant generosity. Uh, having a preacher, having a building, having a, a worship leader, having music, having a live stream, all these things. It's only possible because you give of yourselves. So let us now respond continually to what God has done and said by giving and having our time of offering. turn our eyes upon Jesus, for that is what the disciples did. After they had walked on the road to Emmaus, when they broke bread, they turned their eyes and saw who had truly been in their midst. Would you all please pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks for this day, for worship, the gift that it is, and the ways in which we learn more about who we are and whose we are through worship. We thank you for gathering us together. We thank you for proclaiming your faithful and good word. We thank you for giving us the space to respond through our words and our lives, our gifts, our music. But we especially respond and give thanks that we can break bread with one another, O oh Lord, just as all those who have come before us have and all who will be here after us. And we remember that on the night in which your son gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread. 
and gave it to his friends and said, Take and eat. This is my body. I'm giving it for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, Lord, we remember that your son also took a cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his friends and said, Take and drink. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So, Lord, we have gathered together as people of memory, but also people of anticipation. We look backward in order to look forward. And so I pray, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. By your Spirit, make them be for us the body and the blood of your Son, that in feasting we might be more like his body redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one in ministry to all people in all places at all times, this day and every day. And all God's people say, Amen. Though we are many, we are in fact one in the body of Christ. Though we have sinned, we have mercy, and we have pardon in this, the cup of salvation. Either in front of you or behind you, you will find the communion elements. They are in what looks like an hourglass. On one side, there is a wafer. On the other side, there is grape juice, not port wine. I encourage you, as you're able to find one, to tear off the side with the wafer. Uh, Take that wafer and know that it is the body of Christ broken for you. You may consume the wafer, and then you may tear the side of the grape juice and consume it, knowing that it is the blood of Christ shed for you. So receive this gift from God, not from me, not from the church, but from God. This is the Lord for you. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you reveal yourself to us. Thank you for opening our eyes to your presence in our midst. Give us the strength to continually respond to your good grace, that we might be people who walk in the ways that lead to life and life everlasting. Amen. I'd now like to invite Bright and Rebecca to come join me in front of the altar. Everyone say, hi, Bright. You want to say hi, Rebecca? Rebecca Rebecca really doesn't like this, so we're going to make this short and sweet. Uh, Bright and Rebecca have been worshiping with us uh, for some time now, and uh, as a response to God's work in their life, they have asked if they could join the church, and so we're going to let them do that. If you all would please uh, join me and pray for them. Lord, we thank you for Bright and for Rebecca and for their little one on the way in November. We pray that you would continually uh, bestow upon them your good grace and your love and your mercy. Help us to respond to them with love and grace and mercy that we might see them as part of this church, part of your son's body in the world. Connect them with us and us with them this day and every day. Amen. Amen. Will you too do everything in your power to love these crazy people here with your prayers and your presence and your gifts and your servant? If so, we will. All of you, will you do everything in your power to love these two before you in your care? Pray for them. Ask them good questions. Give them space if they want space. Be kind to them. Cook them meals if they're ever hungry. If so, say, we will. will. Then you all are members. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Back to narration. The fourth part of our worship is sending forth. It is taking our having been gathered and the proclamation that God has made and our response and taking all of that with us as God sends us forth. So here now, our final scripture. That same hour they got up and they returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road, how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. I've always kind of wondered what it must have been like to be there with those two disciples when all of a sudden, because of this bread breaking, having a a new revelation. But then I remember I do know what that's like because I get to experience it every week in worship. This is our Emmaus. Every week that we worship, it's Emmaus. It's God gathering us on the roads of our life. It's 
God proclaiming God's word to us. It's our opportunity to respond and then God sending us forth. Part of what the disciples do is that they run. I mean, they run back to Jerusalem and they cannot wait to tell their friends what has happened. The best Sundays are the Sundays that we leave church thinking, wow, I'm fed. I heard God speak to me today. Not just through scripture, maybe it was an interaction or a song or maybe in the sheer silence. The best worship services are those where we leave feeling like I've got to tell somebody what happened. So I I love a lot of things. I love Star Wars. I love Marvel. I love to read. I love to eat. And I am an evangelist for those things. I love to go. Have you seen the new Star Wars Visions show on Disney Plus? It's incredible. I will talk your ear off. Have you gone to Grace's Pizza? No free ads. I apologize. But man, Grace's Pizza is pretty good pizza. I really like it. And I've told everyone I've met, have you tried Grace's Pizza? And I find myself, I realize I have become an evangelist for the things of my life. But what has Star Wars really done for me? I mean, really done for me. What has Grace's Pizza really done for me? In comparison to what God has done for me, it's nothing. And yet I'm not, I'm not going, have you, have you been to church recently? I mean, have you been bowled over by the word? Have you been fed by communion? Have you heard that music and has it changed your life? That's how the disciples felt. They couldn't help but run and tell the good news. That's what we're called to do too. To find people in our lives who need to hear good news and to share it with them. Because if you can't have fun in church, you're doing it wrong. Thank you, Ed Burgess. So this is how we're sent forth every week. Just like the disciples who ran to tell their friends what they had seen and heard. So now we will be prepared to be sent forth into the world. And narration. Announcements I'd like to share with you. We're doing a candy drive here at the church. You'll see some of it here. We're going to be having a trunk or treat here at the church on Saturday, October 30th in our parking lot. We're asking people to bring candy. We're going to uh, compile it all together so we can pray for it before we hand it out to kids. If you're at all interested in having a trunk that you would like to decorate in our parking lot, please speak with me or some person on staff so we can have an idea of how many trunks we will have so we can plan out our parking lot accordingly. Sunday school happens after the service. If you're in a class, wonderful. If you're not and you'd like to be in one, come talk to me. I will find a place for you. Another way that you might respond to what God is doing in your life. And now, our final song. This is our benediction. This is what sends us forth into the world. We take this song. It is what uh, helps us go and share the good news. So thank you for being with us in worship today. Thank you for joining me on this journey of narration. I promise we won't do something wild like this for a while. (laughs) Thank you, Taylor. Uh, This last song um, I really love because it takes the words and the tune of the traditional doxology. God be praised, and it just kind of changes it up harmonically and then adds an extra kind of little contemporary course on the end. So I invite you to stand and join us on our final sending forth song. And I think Robert's going to lead us here at the beginning. Praise 